Sorry. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to our students online as well. Let's begin this session with prayer, and we'll get into uh, our teaching this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word. Lord, we pray that you will bring revelation into our heart, our spirit of God, even as we learn about the third person of the Trinity, about the Holy Spirit. We pray that all of this that we are learning will be will become real in our lives, in our in everything that we do, O oh God. We commit this two hours into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So last class we looked into chapter eight. So very, very importantly, we looked about we talked about hearing from the Holy Spirit, right? So we have five senses. The Holy Spirit uses those five senses to minister to us, right? Now, remember, it's a journey. We keep learning, right? There will be times we may make mistakes. It's all right. No one will call you a false prophet. You learn from those mistakes, right? But it's a journey. We keep growing. And the more I talk to the Holy Spirit, the more I recognize his leading. The more I fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the more I understand how he talks and how he ministers to me, right? Again, we also looked at how you know the Holy Spirit can speak to us in different ways. He may speak to you in a certain way. He may minister to me in a different way. So we don't put God in a box and say, hey, uh, no, God, you spoke to him like this. Speak to me also the same way. We don't put him in a box. I always say this. God trained Moses in the palace to use him in the desert. But, he, but God also trained Joseph in the desert, used him in the palace. So the way God ministers to us can be very, very different. But it's the same Holy Spirit. Okay? So now let's get into chapter 9. We're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us are clear about the two aspects of the Holy Spirit, right? One is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The moment you and I become believers, the Holy Spirit comes inside us and dwells in us. But Jesus told his disciples, go and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? So now we're going to talk about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Right? Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. Maybe one of us can open to Acts 10, 38. Matthew 3 and verse 11. I yeah. indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I who should. I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mm. This is John the Baptist. He's witnessing to about Jesus and saying, See, I baptize you with water, but one who comes after me will baptize us in the baptize us in the Holy Ghost, meaning in the Holy Spirit. Let's read Acts 10 38. How God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with mm. the Holy Spirit and the uh, and with the power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by by the devil for god was with him it says whom god anointed by the baptism of the holy spirit talking about jesus again acts chapter 2 1 through 4 and this is a very common passage acts 2 1 through 4 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, they were all with one accord in one place. And, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them, cloven tongue like as of fire, it is sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit as the Spirit gave them utterance. Mm. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak in tongues given by the Holy Spirit. Now, important. 
the outpouring or the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all of us as believers. All of us as believers. Now, we can be one week in the Lord and another person can be 10 years in the Lord. For God, both of them are the same. Right? For the Lord Jesus, both are washed by the blood of Jesus. Right? They both are saved by the same uh, power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not depend on how much we pray, how much we read the word. No. I'm sharing this in the second years. God works in spite of us. God doesn't work because of us. You understand the difference? Now, we may, we may need to understand what I'm trying to say, right? Now, imagine this. There's a young boy. He becomes a believer, right? And he's one day in the Lord. He knows Jesus only for one day. He knows his sins are forgiven. One day. He doesn't know anything from the Bible. All he knows is Jesus died on the cross and now he's forgiven. His life has changed. Now he has a friend who's probably blind. And he goes and he prays for that boy, for his friend. And the friend receives his eyesight. Because he prays in the name of Jesus, his friend receives his eyesight. What is it? Is it because this boy prayed? Is it because he read the Bible? Yes or no? Did the, did the boy, did his friend who was blind receive his eyesight because this boy who was a believer prayed for two hours a day and read his Bible? Was it because of that work? No. It was just one day. So we have God's sovereignty. God works in spite of us. Sometimes we may not be praying. We may not be reading the word. God still works. But there is human responsibility. Just because God is working, even when I don't pray and read the word, doesn't mean I stay in that same place. God wants us to grow. Our relationship with the Lord Jesus must only grow. The Bible says he calls us from strength to strength, from glory to glory. So the outpouring of the baptism is for all of us, and it's not given on the basis of how much we pray, how much we don't pray. When the Holy Spirit pours out upon, him, upon us, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we will speak in tongues, we will prophesy, we will have word of knowledge. It's not about how much time I have spent in prayer. But is it important to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Jesus himself said, go and wait, go and pray. 120 of them were praying, earnestly seeking God. And the Holy Spirit came on them. So we must understand this as believers. Don't wait for, for me to learn everything from Genesis to Revelations. And then I'll pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No. The moment you and I become believers, we can pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We pray and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let your Holy Spirit outpour on me. Let the, let the, let the gifts of the Holy Spirit be released in my life. That's a prayer we must make. Okay? Now, how do you and I receive the gifts of the Spirit? Everyone know what are the nine gifts of the Spirit? Anyone would like to say it? Who knows it by heart? All the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Nobody knows it by heart? What are you going to pray and ask God? Who knows it? Anyone? You know the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you said what the fruit of the Spirit is. What are the nine gifts? Who knows it? You know it? Okay, homework. I want you to learn all the nine gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit. Right? All the nine gifts. Okay, how do you and I receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Do we want to receive the gifts of the Spirit? That's the first thing, right? He earnestly gives what we desire. If we desire, he will give it. Seek, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, you will find. So how do you and I receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit? 
Acts chapter 8, verse 5 through 21, talks about this. Acts chapter 8. The Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip gave, hearing and seeing the miracle which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with places and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used so sorcery and uh, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave okay. heed. So we won't read the whole thing. Now, the point of what we are seeing here is, in this entire passage, we see that when the outpouring or the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens, it is always accompanied by supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. Think of this. Acts chapter 2, they are praying. They're praying for the Holy Spirit. And fire comes down and sits on their tongue. A supernatural miracle. And then there were people who were from different parts of the different countries. They are saying, hey, how is it that they are speaking our language? Supernatural demonstration. Then in Acts chapter 9, 17 and 18, this is Apostle Paul. He's seen the Lord Jesus. Now he is blinded. He's in Damascus. He says to Ananias, go and pray for Apostle, for, for Paul, for Saul of Tarsus. And there are Acts 9, 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that moment, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. What is the response or what is the outcome of the filling of the Holy Spirit? Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Now look at this. The next passage, next portion says, he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Very, very important lesson for us to learn. Ananias prayed over Saul. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And supernaturally, the scales in his eyes came out. It fell off. And then he was baptized. What does it teach us? The baptism of the Holy Spirit and being water baptized are two different things. It is not a prerequisite. You know? So for example, I've become a believer. It is not like I have to be water baptized. Only then the gifts of the Holy Spirit will come. Have you heard of these teachings? Right? Sometimes people say that, right? You have to be water baptized. And only after water baptism, you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No. The Holy Spirit can fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then also you can be baptized, water baptized. Okay? So, if we go on, Acts chapter 10, 44 through 48. Again, this is Cornelius. Cornelius, Peter's in Cornelius's house. Acts chapter 10, 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Again, very important lesson. All Peter goes to Cornelius' house. He's talking to the family. And as he was talking, the Holy Spirit decided to come and baptize those Gentiles. And those who were believers saw this and said, 
they were surprised they were astonished how come the holy spirit is come on them they are gentiles because what was the manifestation they were speaking in tongues and praising god so the outpouring or the baptism of the holy spirit is normally displayed with supernatural manifestations of the holy spirit right something that is not natural now for example you may be having prayer time as you are praying or as you are worshiping god you may be filled with the holy spirit some of you may speak in tongues some of you may pray for miracles some of you may get a prophetic word or may get a word of knowledge or some of us may feel very weary but all of a sudden there's faith the gift of faith comes into you and you're no more afraid so all of these are supernatural manifestations you get what i'm saying yes god is supernatural the holy spirit is a supernatural god and when he outpours there is a supernatural manifestation now what is the difference well, before that praying in tongues is one of the most common manifestation of the holy spirit now it is not the only but one of the most common because we see that in scriptures in acts chapter 2 they were praying fire came down on their tongues they began to pray and sing and pray in tongues cornelius's house acts chapter 10 you know they're all praying as he finished the holy spirit came they began to pray in tongues so normally the first manifestation is the speaking of speaking in tongues now remember i'm reiterating this it is not the only somebody a person can be baptized in the holy spirit and begin to prophesy over people or begin to give words of knowledge or pray for working of miracles anything but one of the most common manifestation is the speaking of tongues okay now there's a question here what is the difference between the indwelling of the holy spirit and the baptism of the holy spirit and we looked at this right john chapter 4 verse 13 and 14 john 4 13 and 14 Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of his water of this water will thirst again. Uh, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Mm. Now here the, what is jesus talking about here in john chapter 4 he is talking about the born again experience the samaritan woman is there jesus is saying the water that you give me will only quench my thirst for a while but i have water that will give you that will spring up and become a fountain and you will never thirst again beautiful right john 4 verse 13 let me read that. Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never become thirsty. I Indeed, the water I will give them will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Your Jesus is talking about the born again experience. When we receive the Holy Spirit, the water referring to the Holy Spirit, we will be, we will be chosen for eternal life that's what jesus is talking about here right you will never thirst again you will receive eternal life now that is the indwelling presence of the holy spirit second corinthians 5 17 paul talks about it therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation all things have passed away all things become new now that is your born again experience the indwelling presence of the holy spirit what is the baptism of the holy spirit john chapter 7 was 37 and 38 in the last day that great day of the feast jesus stood and cried 
saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall follow rivers of living water. Yeah. Let's also read John chapter 20, verse 22 and 23. And when he said, and we, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, "Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you re uh, retain the sins of any, they are retained." Yeah. Now, is that John chapter twenty and verse twenty-two and twenty-three? John twenty. And when he had said this. Be, uh, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive he the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins he remit, they are re reminded unto them, and whosoever sins he retain, they are retained. Yeah. Right? Now let's read Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have here from me. Yeah, go ahead. For, for John truly baptized with the water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Right. So we see the difference here, right? Here, Jesus is talking about the indwelling presence. Then we read John 20, where he said he blew on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And Acts chapter 1, he's saying, he, he's telling the disciples, don't depart from here, but go to Jerusalem and wait, for I will send the Holy Spirit and he will baptize you. Right? So we see the difference here. So there's the indwelling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, each one of us have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Even if we are five minutes in the Lord, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But we desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, just a few questions, a few answers to common questions. What is praying in tongues? All of us talk about it in church, right? We have many questions. We may think, you know, many people have many things they would like to say about praying in tongues. But what is biblically? What is praying in tongues? Just a few points here. Speaking or praying in tongues is, is, an, uh, is an unknown tongue, refers to tongues of men and angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Let's keep uh, open to that passage. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Do I speak with the tongues of men and, the, and of angels, but have not love? Yeah. I have become sounding brass or planning kimbles and though i have the gift of prophecy no no so just verse one right if i speak in tongues of men and angels right your paul is writing talking about speaking in tongues speaking in tongues is you are talking you are speaking a heavenly language it is not a made-up language it is not a language that we come up with by our own self Speaking in tongues is an unknown tongue. Secondly, we are speaking directly to God. When you and I speak in tongues, our spirit, the Holy Spirit takes control of our spirit and our spirit is praying to God, the Father. Have you ever thought of that? Imagine you're loving the Holy Spirit to take control over you. And you're praying, you're saying, Holy Spirit, come. And you begin to speak in tongues. You are speaking the mysteries of God and you are speaking directly to God. You're speaking directly to God the Father. And so there will be times, you know, when we are praying. And I've, it's happened so many times. We are praying and we may, we may have to make a decision in life, a very important decision. We are praying, we are praying in tongues. And your spirit is speaking a heavenly language directly to the Father. And the Father can reveal exactly what you have to do. 
He may reveal it to you in a dream, in a picture, or he may just tell you in your spirit, do this. And you can do it. You know that it's the Father's will. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. You see how important it is to pray in tongues. Secondly, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Remember, I may be tired, weary, weak, physically, mentally, emotionally. But the moment I speak, begin to speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit takes control. And my spirit is speaking to the Father directly. And now? There is no tiredness, there's no weariness, and there's no limit. Speaking or praying in tongues has no limit at all. I can go, you can go on for 10 minutes, you can go on for one hour, you can go on for two hours. Why? Because your, your spirit is making intercession to the Father. It is powerful. God can bring revelation into your heart. Now, many, many years ago, when I just became a believer, and a few years, maybe a year later, I started beginning to speak in tongues and trying to understand what it is, trying to understand what are the mysteries of the speaking in tongues. I would spend maybe about half an hour just praying in tongues. But I remember this one time, God just... Now I'm speaking, my mind is unfruitful. I'm not thinking about anything, right? But my spirit is praying. And I remember this one time, I was just praying in tongues, and God very clearly, like a picture, showed me what I must be doing, what I will do in the future. And I saw myself, you know, standing, preaching in front of people. Now, I was, it was not a, it was not a dream. It was not a vision. It was more of the Holy, while I was speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Right. It was, it was like a, like someone telling me, this is what you're going to do. Now that was not in my mind. I never thought that I will get into a full-time ministry. I always saw myself as a manager or doing something in business. I always saw myself that way. But that the Holy Spirit spoke in such a way, and I knew that what I am, what the Spirit is speaking to the Father is revealing my will for my life. That's what the Holy Spirit can do to us. When we speak in tongues, we are directly speaking to God, and God begins to minister to us. Think of this when you are praying in tongues, the enemy. You know, when you're praying normally, the enemy disturbs us, right? There's so many thoughts that come to our mind. We may, we may think of things, or we may want to do something else. Our mind is distracted. But the moment we are praying in tongues, the enemy has lost control. There's no territory for him. He has no idea what is happening. Because my spirit is praying directly to the Father, and no work of the enemy, no demon can stop that interaction unless we are love, unless I stop and say, I don't want to pray. But if I am praying in the Holy Ghost, my spirit is connected to the Father, no work of the enemy can stop that. So for God, so that's it, you know, when we pray in the spirit, praying for one hour is no big deal. Praying for a couple of hours is no big deal. It's not a big deal. It's not a big problem. Why? Because the enemy is not distracting. He, he cannot come in. He cannot interfere when my spirit and the Holy Spirit is interceding with the Father. So there can be times we sit and pray. So some things that I do is morning I wake up, I pray. So about two hours goes just praying in tongues. Evening when I go home, I spend about an hour. It's, it's just normal. It's casual. It just happens. And then night before sleeping, spend about two hours in prayer. It just goes, time goes. It's just a normal thing. It's not, it's not something that I should be pressurized to do. It's normal. You get, you get what I'm saying? Right? So when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it is our spirit speaking to the Holy Spirit. We speak mysteries 
things unknown to my human mind, but known to the spirit. We don't know what, you know, my mind may not understand what are the things ahead for me. Or what are the things ahead for the church, things ahead for the ministry, things ahead for our city, for our nation. We don't understand. But the spirit knows. And so he can intercede for us. Here's the thing, see. Example, I may not have a burden to pray for the nation of Japan. I don't have a burden for that. Right? But when I'm praying in the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit can speak to me and pray for the nation of Japan. Now, on my own, I'm not going to pray for Japan. I don't have that burden. You get, right? You understand? I don't have the burden to pray for Japan. I have a burden to pray for India. Our nation only is struggling. I pray for India. But the Holy Spirit wants to use the opportunity to pray for Japan. So my mind is unfruitful, but he knows what I'm praying for. Right? Next. The Holy Spirit reveals mysteries, the wisdom, the plan, and the purposes of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Let's read that. Very important. We speak the wisdom of God in a ministry, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Look at verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what Christ has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Think of this. What no eye has seen. Everyone say that. What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. I have not seen it in my... I, I cannot see myself doing this. I can never hear the things what God has for me. My mind cannot conceive what God has for me. Jesus said, I'm going up to heaven. I'm going to make mansions for you. You think we, we, we can conceive that? What kind of a mansion is Jesus going to make for me? What kind of a place heaven is going to be? We, we cannot conceive it. We cannot think of it. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. It's so important, right? So when we, when we pray and speak and, and, and spend time in the Holy Spirit, God begins to reveal things to us. Next, my, my spirit prays enabled by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray, it is an unknown. Mm. My spirit prays, but my mind or my understanding is unfruitful. Now, it's very important to understand this. While we are praying, our mind is unfruitful. Our spirit is praying. Mind is unfruitful. But what do I do with the mind? That's a question that may come up. My mind is thinking about lunch, dinner, vacation, beach, playing guitar. Mind is thinking of all other things. So this is our responsibility where I must say to myself, I must be able to, Romans 12, be conformed by the renewing of my mind. I must renew my mind. Now, my spirit is praying, so I just turn my mind towards the things of God. God, I want to thank you. I'm not speaking it out, but my mind is thinking of God. My mind is thinking of maybe scriptures or maybe something that I have read in God's word. My mind is thinking of maybe songs that I can sing of. So there are two things happening here. Now, I, I need to be able to conform my mind. But I'm not control. I'm not control of what I'm speaking. Now, while praying in tongues, sometimes suddenly we may stop and start singing a song. That's all right. But ask the Holy Spirit to take control. We must understand not to disturb the flow of the Holy Spirit, because He's taking control. The moment I start singing a song because I like that song, I may hinder what the Holy Spirit wants to do. See, I'm not doing something wrong. So, for example, I like the song, uh, 
you know, holy forever. I'm praying in tongues. I'm thinking about the song Holy Forever. I've seen the video two, three times already. I'm thinking of the song Holy Forever. Now, suddenly I'll feel like singing that song. I'll start singing that song. Now, nothing wrong about it. Is it wrong? It's not wrong. But what I've done is I may hinder what the Holy Spirit is doing. So I need to learn how to control my mind and bring it into subjection. And this we will learn slowly as we grow in the things of God. These are things we will learn. Finally, praying in tongues is also referred to as praying in the Spirit. When Paul referred to praying in the Spirit, he always meant praying in tongues. Uh, praying in the, very important, underline this. Praying in the Spirit does not mean praying in greater fervency or deeper emotion or more energy. But praying in the spirit means, or praying in tongues means it can be accompanied by intensity, passion, fervor, and energy. Now, okay, let me let me explain this to you. The Holy Spirit, you know, when we are praying in tongues, just because we are screaming and shouting doesn't mean that's the Holy Spirit. Just because we clap hardly and jump in one place doesn't mean that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just because I scream and shout doesn't mean that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You get what I'm saying? Right? Just because I, you know, clap loudly and you know, intensely clap and then scream and then, you know, loudly pray doesn't mean that's the Holy Spirit. I can be quiet in my room and the Holy Spirit can just speak to me very, very clearly. No need of any sound, no need of any screaming. Now, the problem is we have made it in a way that when we see people screaming and shouting, that means that's the Holy Spirit. That's not true. The Holy Spirit is like fire, yes. There can be intensity, there can be fervor, there can there will be passion, zeal, all of that is there. But the Holy Spirit is also like a dove. He can speak to us in a simple, still, small voice. Remember Moses? Is up the mountain. There was a thunder. There was great winds. But God didn't speak through that. God spoke to a still, small voice in the quietness. So very important lesson. Just because maybe a pastor or a preacher is screaming and shouting, it's not a sign of, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit taking control. But when the Holy Spirit takes control, we, will, we may, you know, uh, speak with fervency, with power, the anointing is, is released. But if there's a person who's just speaking very quietly, doesn't mean he or she is not baptized by the Holy Spirit. How many of you have heard, let me share this example. In church history, there was a great man called Jonathan Edwards. I don't know if his uh, frame is here anywhere. Jonathan Edwards. This man was a very... I would say ugly looking man right in the early uh, 1800s he had a big nose he had all you know warts on his face and he had a very unusual routine of pray of preaching what he would do is he would write his whole sermon he will go on the stage and he will read his whole sermon is that uh, something that is interesting he would come, he would put a candle there, and he would read his sermon. But you know what? He spent hours and hours in prayer before that. History says that he would spend four to five hours in praying. He will come, he'll put that candle, and he'll begin to read the sermon. The moment he starts reading, people used to feel that the ground is opening and hell is, is down. They began to come crying. They will come and weep and cry and ask for forgiveness of sins. What is he doing? He's reading the sermon. No screaming, no shouting. 
like what we see now, just reading the sermon. So the point of this example is just because a person is screaming and shouting does not mean it's the baptism or the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is released in different ways. Now, our preaching or teaching styles may be different. The same thing, John Wesley, he was different. You know, he was so loud that the entire college in where he studied, everyone could hear him. People would come with spears when he went preaching into uh, villages. People would come with spears. He would stand there unafraid. His voice was like, under. That's what John Wesley was. Was it the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? Jonathan Wesley reading the sermon, is it the power of the Holy Spirit? So we must understand that, right? Maybe a person is quiet, right? His nature is very quiet. He preaches. Doesn't mean he's not anointed by the Holy Spirit. He is. So we see how it works, right? What are the second question? What are diversities of tongues? The Greek word here is uh, diuresis, which means distinctions, differences, distribution, and varieties. Now, let's look at this diversities of gifts. The word gifts means charisma. The Greek word charisma means a spiritual endowment, a divine gratitude, gratuity, a free gift. The same Holy Spirit is the same source of all these gifts. Same source. So one of the things is I always pray for, I say, I say, God, see, people will, as, as pastors, you know, people come and ask us many questions in the church. Sometimes they ask us what we must do. Now, on my own strength, I don't want to give them counsel, which is foolish. I, I need to give them good counsel. So one of my prayers every day is, Lord, Holy Spirit, fill me with your wisdom that I may learn what to say, what not to say, how to say things, how not to say. Fill me with your wisdom that I may give the right counsel to the right people. People have different questions, different problems in their life. They come up to you and ask for suggestions or feedback or, or you know, or counsel. So I must be able to give them good counsel. Now, for my own strength, if I give counsel, it may go wrong. So I depend on the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, give me the, give me the source, give me that spirit of wisdom. That I speak the right thing. And then some people may come up and say, you know, I'm going through this sickness. Then I tap into the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, give me this, this working of miracles, the gift of faith that you release it. When I pray, let people be healed. Release your power upon them. Do great miracles in our midst. I'm tapping into the Holy Spirit. Right? There's diversities of administrations, which means diconia, service rendered by a servant, ministries and offices. Now, look at this. There is charisma, which is the gifts of the Spirit, and there is diconia, which is service rendered by the gifts of the Spirit. Now, for example, administration. It's a gift. What is administration? Make sure that everything is all right. right? So for example, the Bible college, a lot of things are to be done. Yeah? Administrator, they, they look after many things. Now it's not mentioned in the gifts of the Spirit, but it is released through the gift of the Spirit. You get what I'm saying? Right? So we ask God, God, give me the wisdom to do this well. Diversity of gifts. The same Lord is being served here. Thirdly, is diversity of operations, energima, which is the effect of a thing, uh, of a thing wrought, operation or working that brought about operation or working. It is the same God that is at work. So three things here. You have the spiritual gifts. You have the same gifts that enables people to do administration. It's the same gift that enables people to do operations. So what does it teach us? Whether we are in ministry, whether we are in the workplace, we are working in the IT company, we are in tech support, 
wherein um, you know whatever media graphics entertainment god can give us through the holy spirit the wisdom the grace to do what what has to be done if i am leading a uh, for example i'm i've been called to lead the bible college now i need the diversity of administration and operations i must learn how to do that god give me the wisdom help me to learn help me to do well and there's the aspect of my work also right the same gift can be used as a variety of services so for example you know worship gift of music is not there in the nine gifts yes or no but god has given us the gift of music what should i do i should go back and say god thank you for the gift for the talents that you have given me I'll give it back to you and let your holy spirit right use these gifts even as i learn as i use these gifts for your glory let the power of your holy spirit touch lives and minister to people what am i doing the gifts are given i'm using it for administration or operations for the benefit of the church where christ is being glorified right so it can be art and craft painting whatever it is we can say holy spirit come and help me and we're giving the glory to god some people mistakenly think there is only one kind of tongues which is wrong there are different kinds of tongues some people mistakenly think that tongues serve only one kind of purpose no let me tell you something sometimes when we are preparing a sermon i sit i pause and i pray in tongues i say god i have to prepare a sermon now or i have to prepare for you know living supernaturally this content that i need i need a lot of content right sometimes we record 3 weeks so that's 21 days content i have to prepare it lord give me nothing is coming no idea no plan what topic topically is not coming so pray pray in tongues after finishing praying in tongues sometimes nothing I go back home pray in tongues and i won't be thinking of living supernaturally but suddenly while driving say, oh i can talk about this make a note of it now god has given me the topic don't expect god to come and prepare the topic for you we have to prepare the topic god gives you the song sing holy forever today don't expect god to come and give you the chords you have to find out the chords and do it simple no but, but what is the leading god is told to do it is a work that we have to do some people mistakenly thinks that think that tongues only operate in one way no they operate in different ways okay we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll go into the different kinds of tongues uh, that the holy spirit has for us